Howdy, folks. I'm Jeff Gonzalez, former Navy SEAL, founder of Trident Concept and host of the Bulletproof Workshop, powered by AR15.com, where we discuss knowledge, skills, and ability to help bulletproof your everyday performance in whatever your field or passion. Welcome to Podcast 034. My next guest is a former frogman who parlayed his professional career within the military and other government agencies into a thriving business as a servant leader. He's an international motivational speaker where he delivers his message with passion and energy to help his clients achieve peak performance. He's also the co-host or also was the co-host of the fastest growing popular podcast, Team Never Quit, of which I was honored to be a guest on. Yeah, brother. Brings the same winning mindset from his hard earned experience to formulate five principles for success of which he tours the country talking about, which I love too. He delivers profound insight into both success and failure by deconstructing the critical aspects that have led him to work with championship level teams and fortune 500 companies. The list keeps growing. It's pretty yeah. cool to see that. I, I saw some newer ones on there. There that are, I yeah. In a while. There I was are, like, yeah. wow. Yeah. He's an anti-fear monger, war cry booster, team life advocate, anti-bully author, and positive Attitude promoter. Please welcome to the show, David Rutherford. Hey, brother. <laughs> 27 years. <laughs> so we have to give a little backdrop on the 27 years thing. So uh, David was in a class that I proctored as a third phase instructor back at Bud's 27 years ago. 27 years. <gasps> instructor Gonzalez. Yeah. Wow. You know, it's so instructor <laughs> Gonzalez. <sighs> Who ya, Instructor Gonzo? It's been a while since I've heard that. Yeah, <laughs> Especially man. with that same energy. Oh, yeah. Oh, God. I was always the who ya guy. Yeah, they're, 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 they were. Without always, a doubt. That's right. That's what, well, right. it's because, and you know what? I'll tell you, I'll tell you flat out. The class has no idea how valuable that was because your energy that you brought, it, 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 it enamored everybody else. Like on the instructor cadre, it's like, yeah, that dude is got it, man. Check him out. And so all the little, sh yeah. all the little shenanigans that the rest of the class, <laughs> I'm not saying we overlooked, <laughs> we certainly saw them, but it was like, yeah, all right. Yep. They, they put their, yeah, they, they're smart. They know what they're doing. They got the guy with the, with the energy to yeah. come out and be their guy. That's why I was like the war cry booster, you That's know, right. like he knows yeah. how to bring it. That's right. Uh, so I like to start the podcast off by um, helping the audience to get to know the guests a little bit by mm -hmm. talking uh, about where they came from, where they grew up, where they hail from. Yep. But before you do, let's take a short break to thank our sponsors. New for 2023 from CMMG, the compact action descent is now in nine millimeter. Their descent line took portability to a whole new level and now they've done it again. Available in 6.5 and 10.5 barrel lengths, this compact platform offers the modularity of the AR-15 while being compatible with a wide range of magazines and ammo. The soft recoiling radial delayed blowback system makes this pleasant to shoot and comes with the reliability that CMMG is known for. For more info, check out CMMG.com. Okay, yeah. so we're back. We're back to the show. We've been back for a while. Anyhow, um, Dave, where did you grow up? I grew up in Boca Raton, Florida, the mouth wow. of the rat. Yeah, the, it was, mouth the, rat. yeah <laughs> the mouth of the rat. And everybody's like, well, how the hell is it called that? Well, our natural inlet that we had back in the day is kind of shaped like like a mouth of a rat. And, and so whatever, con, whatever conquistador that labeled that area of, of South Florida, that, that's, that's it. what it was. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. So you grew up on the water. I did. So yeah, absolutely. Being friendly with the water was easy for you. No, <laughs> no. That's what everybody talks to me about. They're like, bro, buds must have been so easy for you. I was like, the hell no, it wasn't. Dude, I was a barge in the water, right? Barge. You know, just because I. The just, little tug engine that could. That, that, and, and, I, and, it, you, and that's one of the things that I was like, oh, yeah, this is going to be great. I yeah. grew up surfing. I grew yeah, yeah. up uh, snorkeling. I yeah. grew up in, and then I got there and it's like, this is nothing like <laughs> South Florida. I'm like, this sucks, man. Where's the winds it get warm? And they're like, never. Oh, God. Uh, you know, that was always something that was weird, too, about the. Uh, the West Coast was that it like, you know, East Coast, there were times when there I'd have to like chip the ice in the in the <laughs> bay to get in the water, you know? That's crazy. And it was cold. But like when you got in the water in the Pacific in June, it's freezing. It was cold. It's bitter. I mean, like uh, yeah. it was like, woo, yep. that wakes you up, you know, yep. and like, you know, like after a run, I can remember running, you know, like having the class 
run into the water to help just cool them down right. because it was just so cold. That was before ice baths were a thing. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. By the way, We've, Buds invented ice baths for much. everybody. Yeah. So. Just like we call surf, it surf torture. That's exactly the only difference. That's, <laughs> that's the right. big difference. That's right. That's right. Oh God. All right. So childhood in Boca Raton on the water. What else kind of, what was a big, like, like, what happened in your childhood that put you on this path? Was there oh, something man. definitive? No, no, ah. I at all. I, I, my whole thing was was athletics, was mm-hmm. football. Like I was from the time I started playing flag tag at four years old. Wow! I football was all I wanted to do in my whole life. Nice. Um, and you know, start playing contact. I think you know, a couple of years later. Mm-hmm. You know, went up the whole Pop Warner level and yeah. weights. Remember where you had to be oh, a yeah. weight? Yeah. yeah. You so, yeah. so, you know, at my my freshman year in high school, I played on the Pop Warner team and on my junior high, you know, my JV team. Wow. You know, football was my thing. And and so just sports was was everything for me. My, hmm. my mom was a, a former state champion tennis player. Wow. And well, that was, explains a lot. Yeah. Was a local pro at a couple different places in and so athletics was just, you know, imbued with my entire existence. So one of the things that I love to talk about, especially guys that have, you know, been through the pipeline, mm-hmm. there, there's a lot of commonalities. I, I feel like, you know, the talent pool uh, for any of the special operations communities is a, it's a small pool, but there's some common themes about that. And, and I feel like one of those, you know, what, like what bill, what is talent in a sense for us? Great question. And I think, I think there is this, um, never ending two things, never ending desire to compete Mm -hmm. and never ending desire to, or you're never quite satisfied with where you are, man. That's a, that could be one of the best definitions I've ever heard of talent. Yeah. That's really powerful. I never looked at it like I always looked at talent for me as this this innate function, right? I forget who uh, one of our friends used to say, I- "I'm only as good until my talent ran out." Uh-huh. Right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And so for me, talent was this default capability that people had, yeah. And then through good training, they could turn that talent into high performance, yes. right? But the way you just describe it, 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 it seems it's like it's a much more sophisticated description. Talent is is imbued within the the psychological profile of the individual as well, too. Right. That, yeah. That the the concept of of future ambition or potential. Right. And that's what generates the 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 ignition point of that that recognition. Hey, I can I possess this ability and I'm going to go for it. Yeah. It's so true because I mean, you know, I think back to when I was a kid and like what, how, like how, how was I motivated to push on? And I think the, in the early stages of my career, it was because I wanted to challenge myself. I wanted to be better than where I was. I wanted to prove that I belonged and I wanted to, that's a huge one. Big time. Yep. I wanted to prove that I earned a place at the table of sorts. And so having been a childhood athlete as well. There was always that drive to compete. And, you know, when you, you you either figure it out early on that, Hey, if I want to, if I want more time on the field, if I want to be a starter, if I want to be varsity, I got to put more work in. That's right. And and I've got to, and, and, and I didn't realize it at the time, but, and it was one of these things that I also think kind of is something that we can both agree on in the sense of humility as well. Like huge, where am I weak? Where's my, like being able to have the maturity to say, okay, I suck at this, but if I want to be at that level, I got to work on it. Well, the nice thing about our generation too, is, is it, you know, that, that, that self-reflection was definitely, um, enhanced <laughs> by coaches back in that day. Cause a, back in the day, yeah. you know, that coach could look over and be like, Rutherford, you suck, you know? And you'd be like, <laughs> okay. You know? And, and, and there was that direct feedback. For there sure. wasn't any fear of retribution from parents right, right, right. or getting canceled or, yes. you know, getting fired because For you sure. said something that would hurt the 100%. feelings of the kid. Oh my God. And so that was a, a real benefit i believe for me in particular because i i i had a a, a cockiness about me early yeah, on and yeah. and i remember i had this this one coach who had spent a little time with the buffalo bills nice my, my first real influence came from a gentleman named mike phipps who was the former hmm. quarterback for the chicago bears and 
and the uh, uh, Cleveland Browns back mm. in the late seventies. And he was my eighty-five pound coach. And I remember we got a eighty-five play put page playbook, you know, wow. at, and we were like, we were like nine years old or something crazy. And I'm like, what the hell is this? And, 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 and but I remember the professionalism that he brought forward and there was a swagger to yeah. him. And I was like, that's cool. And then a couple of years later, I got access to this other guy who was like, listen, you, you, you have a, a style about you with your attitude, but we need to shape that because mm. that arrogance could very easily mm. turn into something that's going to be detrimental to 100%. you. So this guy tuned me up every single day. No, yeah, yeah. that's not the yes. appropriate way to treat your linemen. Yeah. No, that's not the appropriate way to treat your receivers. No. Hey, just because you just threw that nice pass, put your hand down, get back in a huddle and then lead, mm. you know, that way. Don't don't have this bravado. So, you know, what's so funny. It's like I feel like and uh, that was also indicative of the the culture, our mm -hmm. culture, you know, like, yes. the sea daddies, the veterans would would basically tune you up and shape you in a sense. And I feel like it started to kind of th that 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 part of our culture started to erode towards the end. Like That's it right. became less. I don't know if it was pushback from higher authority or the younger generation didn't see the value in it. I don't know what it was. You want to hear my theory? Please. All right. Here's my theory. Because everybody wants to blame these poor little kids, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That the kids are soft. Yeah, Everybody's yeah, yeah, soft, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. I hate those damn kids, the right? Pepsi generation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Everybody gets a damn trophy, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, guess what happened? So all of us that grew up under the guise of, of uh, the, the greatest generation's kids, the baby boomers, yeah. who were hammered the dog's not out of them by... For World sure. War II generation. Yeah. You, know, you, you I mean, imagine if you were born in 1900, what, what you went through, right? <laughs> so, so that hardness transferred onto the baby boomers, which then transferred onto us. Yep. And so when we, when, when, when certain people got to be adults and started having kids, they were so hyper intense with their children on the field and in their, <laughs> with their coaches. And yep. that finally like coaches were starting like, Hey, get out of here. Yep. And and they realized, hey, no, you have to take a step back, sit in the sand, shut up. Yep. Let me coach your kid yeah. and let me help work with your kid. And so a lot of these, I think, younger kids from the 90s and early 2000s were in shell shock because yeah. there was this hel the helicopter parent had mm -hmm. taken place. Yeah. And now all of a sudden, you know, you see a lot of that. It's beginning to shift back, I think, where, yeah, I, I think we played a definitive role or maybe maybe not necessarily – the you know probably the, the the maybe 10 years older than us the mm. the people that had those young kids that yeah. were in those you know from 1991 to yeah. to 2010 right in that space is where that helicopter parent yeah. just polluted or infected yep. that relationship between the coach and the player interesting and that's what i believe shifted the whole all right well I'm not going to get sued. I'm not going to get attacked. I'm yep. not going to get in trouble. I'm not, I'm, I'm not even getting yep. paid. I'm doing this to volunteer. For sure. And I have 10 out of my 20 parents screaming at me yep. every day because their kid who doesn't want to invest any time has to play. Yep. So, you know what? I'm just going to back off and I'm going to take that old school style and, and go home. Wow. You know what? I the thing that really resonates with me is that you literally describe me as a young parent with my kids. <laughs> Not gonna lie, <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. I, I'm gonna take ownership of that because I feel like that's exactly what I did. Yeah. And you know what's funny? And I look back at that, and part of the reason, and and this is no, this is no blame towards those coaches because, like you described, they're volunteers, they're taking time out of their, they're from their families, that's from right. their work to do that. And I sometimes kind of gave myself a little reprieve because what I could, what I would sense is I would sense that there was something. Not right. Yeah. Something that needed to needed attention, something that needed to be fixed. Like I can't help it. You know, like in an absence of leadership, you can't help but step forward. Well, and, lead. and, and also remember, <laughs> you, you're a unique individual, Jeff. I mean, I, I, there, there are many people I know that picks up every single detail that's taking place. Right. Yeah. The nuance of of tonal shifts, the nuance mm. of of how to teach well. Yeah. Right. And you pick up all those things For because sure. of your background. So most people yeah. have no experience at coaching, teaching, mentoring, 
whatsoever. Yeah. And so what they do is they just transfer whatever talent they have yeah. that's relative to the action needed in the moment yep. of instruction. But they're pulling from their, as 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 we know, your past experiences, yeah. your past coaches, your past references. 100%. But they don't have any system of training in place. They don't have any idea of how to set up a coaching philosophy, a training doctrine. Man. Or an uh, or you know a a a, a game a game mentality, a game yes. plan, right? And that's what I see more than ever is, is, you know, people complain so much about how poor coaching is out there right now. And I say, well, it's just that people don't know how to put all those things together. So an, uh, I do feel like I made amends awesome. at some point because you can you can sit back and complain and bitch and moan, or you can actually step forward and try that's to do right. something about it. That's right. So um, I had the one of my highlights as a parent was being able to coach both boys at the same time on the same Whoa, team. Yes. That must've been it awesome. Was, it was awesome. Um, they were, uh, I can't remember how old they were, but they were still like an elementary middle school time. Cause yeah. my younger son is right there and uh, it was uh, lacrosse. And I didn't really know. Ah, yeah, ah. I didn't know a lot about, I didn't play lacrosse as a kid, yeah. so I didn't know anything about it. So I had to go to a coaching clinic. Uh, I had to learn about it. And then um, I, I was, uh, I joined the team as an assistant coach yeah. and, and like at that point I had a completely different perspective, yeah, a very different perspective. And one of the things that I really appreciated about the coach that we had was he was like there, there obviously it's like any other sport where everybody has to play, everybody is involved, yep. all that other business, but he did things differently that I came to appreciate. What he did mm -hmm. was, um, he incentivized the kids to get out there and do things. That's cool. And it, it was really, and so like I'm sitting there like now, like, cause I, I left this coaching clinic. It was like a three day coaching clinic <laughs> and they teach you not just the, the do's and don'ts from a legality point of view, but right. they actually teach you part of the game. That's cool. So I'm thinking, ah, oh, I know this now. Let, let, this is how, you know, just basic plays and yep. basic drills and stuff like that. Oh, we're going to do awesome. And as I sat back and like watched this guy really take, like I had a completely different perspective because now I had new information yep. that helped me to really see it. And the difference in my demeanor, the difference in how I engage the kids, the difference in how I engage my own, my own kids. Yep. Totally Night and day. Yeah. Night totally day. different. Yeah. It was, that's, it was probably one of the best things that happened to me as a parent. That's what great coaches do, right? Yeah. Coaches help you shift perspectives. Yeah. That's so true. Yeah. Right? And, and that's the beauty of it. Cause when you think about how many different places you can receive that level of influence, right? Mm -hmm. Right. You're with, in, when you're growing up in school, you know, you're from 730 till three, you're <laughs> with all your prerequisite mm -hmm. teachers. And if, you know, and it's rare that you get the the one teacher that has 50 kids, 30 kids who can really focus on you and pull out the best in you. Yes. And, and, and so for me, athletically, it was always just, all oh, right, I just got to go through this. Then I got to get to my sport and that's where I'll shine. And, and it's funny that you talk about lacrosse because lacrosse was a huge shift for me. And really, my, oh, absolutely. You know, I, I was all football and then freshman year and I'd played baseball up until freshman year. And, and I went to the school, St. Andrews in Boca Raton and, and all of a sudden there was lacrosse mm -hmm. and I was like, whoa, I get to hit people twice in a year. I was like, this is going to be awesome, man. I love it. Well, I had some decent coaches and, and, wow. and I was like, wow, this game is so much more fluid. It's what? so much more technical. Oh yeah. It's got that aspect of basketball, the aspect of hockey. It's He's got so the true. aspect of, of soccer It the field spread out. And I just took to it yes. to where, you know, that became what, you know, I played in college, which was, you know, I, I will tell you yeah. straight up. I wish like I was lucky. I swam and played water polo. Yeah. So I'm very grateful for that. But man, I wish I could have played lacrosse as a kid. I know I would have loved it. Just the, 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 the like just the game, the history behind the game. The Gataway, first, man. Yeah, the history behind the game yeah. is awesome, first of all. Yeah. But then how it's played. And we were so lucky 
you know, it, it, it exploded here in Texas right when the kids were getting involved. Uh, they had great mentors. They got to they, they got to uh, to learn from like professional because the professional league is still such a yep. small league that yep. the the players are willing to come out and do things. It was a great environment for the That's kids. Cool. Yeah, they yeah. really had some great um, experience and exposures there. So that was a lot of fun. Yeah, for me it was it was it was still early. Mm. It was mostly a New England sport. Yeah, without I a remember doubt. I I was the 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 Florida representative to the national all-star game when I, yeah. And, and I remember I showed up at at Johns Hopkins for the all-star game and, you know, I walk out on the field and back in the day that like the number one recruit of the year, his name was Ryan Wade. He went to UNC and he was, he was like, there was, you know, I, I was, I went out to, to our little practice we had and I watched this kid and I'm like, I can't do that. Man. And I was like, holy <laughs> Whole new level. Oh, and I'm watching these kids from Maryland and oh, yeah. Long Island and, and Philly. And yeah. I was just like, so we had nine mini lines on, I think I was on the East or the West. I was on, there was an East and West. Nice. I was on the West team. There was nine mini lines. Holy I was, cow. Yeah. I was on the ninth mini <laughs> line. <laughs> With the guy from Colorado and California, yeah, and and it, they were both the emerging. Yes, we were all the 100%. emerging. Now, now it's funny. I I was working a little bit with a kid from my old high school last couple of years, mostly in football, but he was he was the, a starter. Wow, on the national Under Armour game, no at long kidding. stick midi. He was number one long wow. stick midi in the country. And he was he got recruited and got a uh, went to Harvard to play You're there. Kidding. Yeah, so that's how far it's true. In, in in thirty years from me ninth line yeah. midi to him being first line yes. and one of the top players in the country. It's incredible. Like you know, like uh, it started to spread and it became like we we hit it right when it was starting to really explode on the scene here. Yeah. And and it was difficult because it wasn't a division 1 sport, so yep. there wasn't a lot of money thrown at it, uh, you That's know. Right. So it, it it wasn't it wasn't until we knew it wasn't until like A&M and UT made it a division 1 That's sport right. that it would all of a sudden start to explode even more yeah. here. But it was awesome. We got lucky both my uh, both kids were extremely talented in that sport alex my younger one chose to kind of move away from it mm-hmm. but uh, my older one he played on select teams oh wow and we went we went all the way to boston yeah on a um we went to a um like a weekend seminar that we got invited to and it was so fun. It was a blast. And it was hilarious. Well, the culture and the cross is what? super fun. Yeah. It is a very, it's, it's like, that, the, that's actually the, like the land surfers, dude, the land surfers. Dude, dude that, like I, I attribute my success in the teams, right? Yeah. Because I was, I played D1 lacrosse nice. at Penn State. Like uh, what I learned with that group of guys yes. prepared me oh, man. for the pummeling I took in the teams, right? <laughs> the pummeling I took at Penn State prepared me for the pummeling I took. I at I love it. Yeah, oh, it was yeah, great. And yeah. you know what's so funny is like they were so open and, e- and easy going. That's right. They welcomed us, you That's know, like right. the, in the very beginning. They're like, hey, where does everybody come from? You know, and they're all like, ah, you know, New York, New Jersey, yep. you know, Pennsylvania. And then, you know, my older one, Andrew, goes, I'm, I'm from Texas. Texas? They got lacrosse in Texas? <laughs> That's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and through the weekend, he really set himself apart. What's hilarious. This is what I remember most. Is this like a summertime, June, July time period that we went out there? Maybe right. even, maybe it could be in May or June. I don't remember. Right. And they had like these mandatory water breaks yeah. that they made the kids take. I can't remember what the interval was. And and they would like literally go to the sideline, have to sit, take their helmets off, drink water. Then they'd call them back out to the field. And Andrew's a- Andrew was like, why, "Why? You know, why are we stopping? Why are we stopping?" <laughs> He's like, like a bunch of wussies. This, is, this isn't hot. <laughs> this isn't hot. You That's guys right. don't know what hot That's is. Right. That's and right. And the nurse, the the head nurse, finally came over because he would just come over and just stand there with his helmet and stick in his hand. Yeah. No, 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 no water. And the, the the nurse finally goes, "If you don't sit down, take your helmet off, and drink water, you're not going back on the field." And so he was like, check, check. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. like, all right, attitude adjusted. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. That's awesome. All right. So give me something that you do for yourself every day that helps continue to move you forward. Oh, wow. That's, that's, that's a good question. Um, hmm. I think for me, one of the most important things is, is praying. Ah, yeah. I pray a ton. Yes. Um, that, uh, but uh, talking with my wife. Oh, I love that. Yeah. She's my best friend. And, and it's been, 
you know, we've been together five years. We just got married a year Congratulations, ago. Congratulations, yeah, brother. Thanks, brother. So happy for yeah, you. Yeah, thank you. She, she just, that communication, I never understood. Like, I always thought of myself in terms of relationships as a good communicator, <laughs> right? I, not, not, I'm but, laughing because I can feel the same right, way. Right, right. And it's because it, I, I could communicate ideas with people. I could extrapolate ideas with people. Mm -hmm. But I didn't, I didn't realize that when it came to that the intimacy component, there was always some type of, 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 um, apprehension maybe uh -huh. like you, you, you know, you invest in someone, you, you cultivate that rapport and you, you generate that trust, but it's, it's always like, there's a little standoff, there's a little standoff for sure. I know exactly what you mean. But with Jana, it's been like, oh my God, well, we, I can really, here's a person that is genuinely interested to, on how I feel about that particular thing mm. or, or, or she's able to pull more out of me that I otherwise wouldn't give. And yeah. which is kind of ironic because I'm a professional speaker, right? Which is I bizarre. And, and I think that's probably why I'm, I was not a good communicator, huh. right? I'm good at, at, at projecting, yes. but I'm not good at, at uh, taking in. Yes. Right. And I think that was a major component of all of my relationships that didn't, that weren't healthy yeah. throughout my adult life. So now it's, yeah, that's the thing that really grounds me. I love you. You know, she'll imagine. call me out and be like, <laughs> you know, hey, that's that's BS. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not cool. So that that I think the the praying oh, God. and then and then the communication with my wife. Well, you couldn't have two better traits if you if you, if you i mean you know, yeah, but remember bro we're going from the time where like it was a glass of jack yeah and, you know, tell, you know, yeah. but i mean yeah, seriously yeah. though you know you yeah. know your relationship with god your relationship yeah. with your with your spouse the two most important things in your yeah. life and you do that on a daily basis like that yeah. that to me is powerful resonates like my relationship with jamie has taken you know like we had that same kind of we came to those crossroads early in our relationship and she yeah. was very um, very genuine in, in her approach towards everything, which made it easy for me to open up and talk with her. Yeah, huge. That was a hard part for yeah. me too, is like, you know, there is a trust issue, but it's a different level of trust. That's right. And when you felt that genuineness and that um, just, you know, that acceptance of sorts. That's huge. Yes. That's the key. Yes. The, more, the older I get, the more I realize how critical it is for an individual to have a deep understanding and not quite a, 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 a structured metric of, of acceptance, but a deep understanding of what it is, mm. how, how they, their psychological process to get to that place mm. of acceptance and then letting go. Mm. Right. Cause like, mm. Hey man, I, I accept the fact that, you know, whatever happened, happened, I yeah. got it. But then it's like letting it go. Oh. That's the that's the thing that's the next challenge of oh, it, right? Yeah, and, without a doubt. and it's like acceptance and then some something like this. It, then it ultimately maybe becomes forgiveness. Oh wow. And, and those are heavy. Man, I'll tell you what, and and forgiveness is another nuance for me and and my relationship here. You know, both being able to forgive myself and yeah, forgive and be forgiven. You know, that's those are you know, you would think that that's just like a normal everyday thing. I think it's not just at all, but I think in particular for us, it's mm. even more complicated, <laughs> right? Because the oh, yeah. whole pretense of, I think what, what holds together the power of the peer influence that is the governing force of our community. Yes. Right. To know that every day I am, I'm, I'm working my ass off. So I have your acceptance. Yes. Right. 100%. Right. But then it's like, man, then it there's this strange thing that can take place dependent upon, I think, time in the the group collective. But mm. over, overall, it's like then it becomes almost a destructive force, too, because now mm. I'm I need to be accepted potentially. In a as a it's not quite a class classification, but I need to be accepted to fit in mm -hmm. regardless of what the moral structure of fitting in is about. Whoa. And, yes. and, and so that's where it's like, oh no, I don't necessarily want to be accepted in that group, Yeah, but I'm programmed to feel like I need to be. I, I know exactly you know what that you're feeling? talking. Yes. Yeah. Because, you know, you, you know, that's, that's the ultimate drive that 
so many folks within our community have. Yeah. You know, you never want to be the guy to let the team down or be responsible for mission failure. That's right. So you go out of your way to do everything to not just pull your end of the load, but carry other people's That's load right. as well. That's right. And so you are con- like, like I want the guy next to me, left and right, to know that I've done everything I can to prepare and be ready. Um, and, and then that generates that acceptance. Yeah. And that is the, that is the, like the core essence of the brotherhood of a sort. That's, that's what really makes the connectivity between us so strong. I'll tell you what, one of the most devastating moments in my career in the teams happened. I had a senior chief that I was working with at the time. Uh, you know, his name was Bruce Cunningham. You remember Bruce, oh. right? Yeah. And he was my, oh, my I mentor. I love that guy, man. He was my mentor. And, Fuck, and he's the guy that, that really just took my, my, mm-hmm. my perception of that peer, that the need to be involved in the peer acceptance. And he just decimated, he fractured <laughs> it into a million <laughs> splinters. <laughs> and he said, you know, he goes, he goes, Rut. You don't need to be an alcoholic to be accepted in the community. 100%. Right. You don't need to talk shit all day long about people to be accepted. Yeah. All you got to do is do your job as best as you possibly can. And That's you'll, it. you'll, the people who you want to be accepted by, right? Boom. Right. And for me, it was at that time, it was, it was Chris Good. It was Matt Lennig. Yeah. It was Dan Sorello. Yeah. You know, it was these guys that had such a huge impact on me. Yeah. That is like, no, man, just do your damn job and and avoid and all that, that other stuff. Avoid it. Man, like just so go true. the other way. Dude, I felt the same way. Like I've had this conversation on this podcast about alcohol and what kind of like the, you know, like my um my my grandfather, who I never met because he died oh, wow. of liver cirrhosis before I could meet him. Wow, um, you know, was an alcoholic, and so it you know it runs in my genes. And and man, I'll tell you, it, it was prevalent when I was a young frogman. I mean, there were times when I Jeez. would just sit there late nineties in yep, the teams. It dude, was insane. Man, I was like, I I my my roommates would come home and I would just be sitting there with a bottle, just drinking by myself. Yep. And I mean, it took some time before. <sighs> you know, shit got sorted out, but that was, well, remember like the old days, I remember hearing stories, you'd check on board one of the coasts <laughs> and like for the rite of passage is, you know, Dude. as a chief is how many DUIs you've got, <laughs> had. I mean, it's like, how is that like a cool thing? I don't get that, oh, but, but you know, and I, thankfully, yeah. I really believe a lot of that changed post 9-11, I right? Agree. Once, once the operational tempo went That's through the, the roof, there was no pressure yes. to, to th- there was nothing forcing the acceptance yeah. that, hey, man, I, I'm not in the in the best place yeah. to really be the best at what I yeah. could buy to maximize my talent and potential. Yeah. And I think, you know, the wars really clean that up. A well, bunch. I couldn't agree with you more on that because I, one of the things that I remember, and I recall was, you know, as a young frogman being in combat and then not having anything throughout the rest of my career, there was always this longing, this, um, I, I can imagine this, yeah. like, like you were always looking for a fight. Yeah. Always looking for a fight, no matter what. It, Wally Graves talked about oh, that too. I fucking love yeah. Wally. Wally talked about that a lot, man. In Dude. our platoon, he's like, you know, you guys don't understand and we'd be like, wow, why don't we understand? He goes, you don't understand what it's like to go, to taste it, and then to always be it's longing like, for it. It's like, yeah. I, I, I reference it like uh, like a vampire's, you know, thirst for blood. It's That's like right. you you can't live without it. Yep. I mean, dude, and Wally was in my platoon. I know. And that was like, I he know. was one of those mentors that yeah. kind of helped drive so much of that home, like yep. the right way. And I struggled like that, I think was both my greatest asset and biggest liability. For sure. Because I constantly was always butting heads. Yeah. Like, we we shouldn't be doing it this way. This is not how we need to do it. Yeah. We need to be doing it this way. <laughs> That's and right. Then, and then when I couldn't, you know, like, in you if you can't find conflict on the battlefield, you'll find it someplace Anywhere else. Anywhere you can. <laughs> you and, find I, it. and where I would do it, I'd just drive it into my own head. Yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. I would find it in the bar. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> I was never like the brawler, but I, oh, I love man. I love to stir the pot when I was Dude. with the brawlers, right? So I, I I have 
to my credit, I never started a fight. My I, there's one fight that theoretically <laughs> depends on who you talk to. I might have started. I believe that fight was started well before I threw the first punch. There you but, go, there you go. but um, but, but man, you know, you'd go to the bar, you'd see one of the, you'd see one of the brothers in the, and he'd get back into a corner. That's all it took. That's well, it. I, it. Like, and I would fly off the handle. Yeah. Sometimes fly over things yeah. to get to there. Yeah. So there was never um, shortage of that kind of. Peer, yeah, that peer evaluation, right? That was the other thing yeah. to be accepted That's as right. a as a straight up hardcore trigger puller. I'm a freedom fighting, rooting, tooting, barrel chest, and fighting fucking frog man, man. <laughs> every day, a- every day, and twice on Tuesdays, <laughs> yeah. Every day, and twice on Tuesdays, and it's like you. I remember, you know, you, instructor Ashelman, oh, Corey Knowles, yes. Uh, God, I um, love those guys. Oh, you know, just these these. You all, you're, you know, you obviously you place these, all of you on the pedestal and it's, and it's like, okay, how am I going to be accepted by them? Mm. Like how is yeah. Kyle Gillespie <laughs> going to look at me and say, I like Rot. I, yeah. I want to go to war with I'm Rot. Ready, yeah. Right. And I'm just Dude, like, same I can't. thing. I, you just feel that pressure yeah. of acceptance, man. Dude, I 100%. In yep. fact, it's so funny because every generation it's the same. It doesn't That's matter. Right. It's always the same. That's like right. I had a great conversation with one of the instructors that put me through training. Oh, wow. A guy named Phil Januzzi. Oh, wow. Dude was, I mean, back in the day, just, just imagine. I mean, he like, just, he was like what a frog man looked like. That's right. Totally. Yeah. Just a big dude. <laughs> early ass fucking mustache. Didn't give a shit about anything. Nothing. And back in the day, like even before. You tight UDT. <laughs> oh, yeah. Right. But that's boots. also when they could put hands on you. Oh, yeah. And, you know, that was like, oh, my. and here I am a scrawny little 145 pound. Well, I was about 150 at that point. Yeah. And he would just like manhandle you around. But I remember when I ran into him on the teams. And dude, it was like a revelation. That's right. It was such a revelation. And 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 all that stuff that you just talked about, acceptance, um, drive, you know, pushing forward, you know, it just all came together at That's that point. That's cool. It was. And I still talk to him every now and then uh, through social media, which is great. So Phil, if you're listening to this, thank you for all those. You rock, Phil. Thanks <laughs> for those, setting the standard. This, oh, he set a yeah. very high bar for me. That's yeah. for sure. Because he, that was the other thing too. He laid at my feet an expectation. That's I love that concept. Yes. I love the actual, the, the, the conceptual reality that, that human beings can, can actually put forth this, this, um, this, this responsibility. 100%. Right. It, it's, it's passing that mantle of mm-hmm. responsibility mm-hmm. off. And I, and then, and then the key and, and to continue down that line of acceptance, the willingness to take that burden yes. and run with it. Oh, right? like I was like, I, I'll tell you one other thing about that disappointment. Yeah. Disappointing somebody like yeah. that. And I can remember in buds, there was a moment where I dis. I remember he came up to me and he said it and it was like, I just shriveled up inside my core just shriveled. He goes, I'm, I'm disappointed in you. Yeah. And that was it. He just walked off. Yeah. Said it. No, so nonchalant. That was it. Everything else that anybody could have done to me was nothing compared, compared to, to that. those words, That's those right. words coming out of his mouth. Just, Oh, <sighs> The letdown. Fuck. You dude. just let down your Fuck, hero. Dude, yeah. Man, it was the worst. Yeah. All right. So um, what's been your biggest challenge in life? Wow. Um. Hmm. That's a f- powerful question. Mm. I would say. You know, I I think prior to my divorce and starting at 16, I think it was my greatest challenge was um, not being able to really admit I was wrong. Oh. Yeah, I, I struggled with that. I struggled with that. Oh, and it wasn't like I, I perpetually blamed other people. I, I, I never, mm. I never was about that. I just, in my own head, I would struggle with going, no, you're wrong. Mm-hmm. You're what you're doing is not the right thing to do right now. Yeah. And, and I would battle that. I would, I learned very early to, um, to, to, to rationalize my, my, uh, moral relativism, if you will. 
um, oh, yeah. in a way that I, I could justify behaviors. I could justify yes. my intention. I could justify my uh, contortion of the truth I was telling myself. And I think because of that, I never was able to really maximize uh, the idea of what my potential could be. I just couldn't. I was always coming mm, up short. I'd, I'd do something really well, but I wouldn't do it at the level that I had imagined I could do it. And so that was that was probably the, the biggest challenge I had up until the divorce. And then I'd say now my biggest challenge is, is saying no. <laughs> yeah. Dude. Yeah. That's my biggest challenge is I, I've, it's almost as if I want to, um, I want to rectify, uh, the things that I didn't do before because of that, um, contortion of my own truth. Mm -hmm. And now I'm, I'm like, I want to, I want to make things right. And so I think that's a big challenge because that that has a real tendency for me to pull me away mm. from the responsibility of being a dad to four girls, mm. being a, a good husband to Jana, being a good friend. Because, uh, you know, I, everybody laughs you know, like, right, you have like 50 best friends, man. And I was like, <laughs> I, I don't know what I just like people. Right. And, <laughs> and, and so, I, 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 you know, I'm yeah. I'm always, you know, my you know, I will be in the middle of something and someone will call and I'll be like, oh, I got to take this yeah. call. and. And, you know, John's like, you know, you're with your kids right now yeah. or we're, you know, you just got off the road. You went Monday to Friday and we only get you for 72 hours. And, you know, you're, you're taking phone calls in the middle of soccer games. You're, you're going to, uh, you know, coffee meetings on, on mornings. Like I, I just, I got, just got hit yesterday. I had, I had agreed to go do a, a speech at my kid's grade school. Nice. And, and I found out that I had double booked something for oh. that. And, and, and it's like, God, I just, and so saying no, not in a negative way. Right. Yeah. But in the way that to, to really pay closer attention and it's and the, the irony is, is, is it's <laughs> profound. So before like I would hammer myself for not doing the best. And now I'm hammering myself for not doing enough, which enables, which makes me not do my best. And so it's some, it's something, it's some bizarre thing in the middle of all. That. I love yeah. hearing that yeah. first of all. And you know, what's so interesting to hear is like, I, I mean, I have the, the hardest word for me to say is no, you know, I just, I never want to say no. Like, I feel like I'm letting people down. Yeah. And, you know, that goes back to the, to the teams. Thank like you. when somebody, Hey, we need somebody to do this. That's it. I'm your man. Yeah. You know, yeah. like, uh, like no was never, I'll figure something out, you know? And that's an other interesting thing too. Like when we were always tasked with something, it never, you know, it was, it wasn't about, it was about how to solve the problem. That's it. And, and I always, in a timely like, manner. Yeah, yeah. And I always took that as like, that's okay. That's what I latched onto. It's not necessarily the mission. It's how do I solve this problem? That's right. You know, it's unique. Okay. We've got like a hundred foot kill zone and it got a 15 foot wall and there's searchlights everywhere. All right. How do we solve this problem? You yeah. know, how are we going to do that? You know, that, that part of the mission planning phase, I loved, I, I bet loved, you did. it was yeah. so much fun, so much fun, but like saying no. And, and today, and what I have to do to, to make that work is I have to process it through filters. You Interesting. Know, like, what do you mean? Well, so like my hierarchy of priorities, like yeah. my first priority is family That's and then right. my second priority is fitness. And then my third priority is faith. And then my fourth priority is finances. So yeah. like, that's how I kind of go through things. I look at how that works and uh, you know, like where does that fall in? Um, if it doesn't conflict with any of those other ones, then yeah, I'm pretty good. I, I'll say yes. I'll, I, I won't say no. Right. But I've had, um, I've had more success and I'm, Maybe it's because I'm older and a little bit more mature at saying no. For sure. But I'm able to say no, not just because I say no, but because I can process it through those filters nowadays and I can see what what is value. What is value to me? That's the interesting, I, I think. And I'm I'm only really discovering, you know, how to quantify or how to measure value as it's as it's integrated with those hierarchies, yes. right? Cause now, now it's like, okay, I've got my a priori hierarchies, mm -hmm. right? I've got, and now all of a sudden within those, I have to establish a value system and break those out into their own value hierarchies. Yes. And, and, and that's a complicated thing, oh, especially, goodness. you know, you, you think you become a lot more sophisticated with <laughs> your time management, yeah. but it, it, I don't, I definitely don't. <laughs> 
<laughs> but 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 it's so it's now I'm like, all right, how how do I do that? And and Jonna really helps me. That's nice. you know, she's like, well, you know, let's let's put that into context of of, yep. of what we need to have happen in, you know, in this time and in so that time. True, yeah. Man. So Dude, Jamie does the same yeah. thing. She's like that master chief that rolls into your mission, <laughs> your mission plan and just goes, no, yeah, no, yeah. no, that shit don't, that won't work. <laughs> none, of, none of that. You guys are dumb. Go back over. Start all over. Start. Scrap that plan. <laughs> She'll yeah. do that to me. She'll yeah. just bring up something nonchalant, casually. And I'd be like, yeah, inside, I'm saying to myself. Yep, that's right. And outside, I'm like, good point. A- acknowledging you. <laughs> that you didn't know what you're doing. No, yeah. it's, it's it's fun because at this point, I look at that more as opportunities for growth. Yeah. Even though uh, it still hurts, yeah. still is a little painful. You know, I still kind of process that as okay. I'm I'm in a perpetual state of learning. Amen. Um, and and my uh, my goal is to take on as much information as I possibly can. And I can't do that if I'm if I'm closed off to that type of feedback. That's right. That's brilliantly put. Well, well yeah. it didn't come easy. No, <laughs> it never does. <laughs> no, it doesn't. But I love that about you know one of the things that you said too about the the biggest challenge early on it was to me I think is very indicative of a lot of guys. At, at our level, mm-hmm. you know, it's really like there are a lot of challenges, a lot of a lot of things competing for your time. Absolutely. And, and you know, it it was was one of those things where there's only 24 hours in the day. I can't fit more shit in. Right. And I'll never forget. I had a conversation with somebody. I uh, don't remember. I believe it was still on the East Coast because mm-hmm. I can kind of see the. The, uh, the the building, the color of the building. Mm-hmm. And we went in there to discuss something. And I remember like it was a planning cycle. And you remember how back in the day they would have on those, the whiteboards that had like your entire deployment cycle yeah. listed on there. Yeah. And yeah. I was like, we need to do this. It has to be done. Yeah. And the ops chief pulls me over to the board. And he's like, where do we fit it in? What is less important that we can pull or, con- or condense that's right. or shave, shave yeah, yeah, or shave yeah. that you can fit that in there. That's right. Find that time on the board. And I was like, oh, yeah, fuck. Yeah. So yeah, that was good. New for 2023 from CMMG, the compact action descent is now in nine millimeter. Their descent line took portability to a whole new level and now they've done it again. Available in 6.5 and 10.5 barrel lengths, This compact platform offers the modularity of the AR-15 while being compatible with a wide range of magazines and ammo. The soft recoiling radial delayed blowback system makes this pleasant to shoot and comes with the reliability that CMMG is known for. For more info, check out CMMG.com. I like to ask this question as well because I feel like this is also and ties in well with the challenge, Mm -hmm. which is, what do you think was your biggest mistake? Oh, (laughs) <laughs> how, how long do we have? Well, how long do we have? Because I, I mean, I, it's a long list, Jeff. This is a long list. Yeah, I, I, I literally, what do you want me to start at like at how five? About, how about, how Holy about, cow, how, Jesus. I don't, we about, don't have enough time. Well, we'd maybe, break some of Sean's records if we did this. It'd be like seven, seven and a half hours of, of my therapy session oh, with you right how now. How about we just talk about maybe one that stands out? Okay. Uh, <laughs> Um, I think my greatest, one of my, my, my biggest mistakes was, um, not closing myself off from faith at an early age. Interesting. What do you mean by that though? I grew up in my parents. We never went to church, didn't Mm. have it. It wasn't part of my family. Um, you know, I don't think, I mean, my, I, I don't think my parents, you could consider them to be dedicated Christians. I think they, they like the, the structure of morality that's Mm. affiliated with Judeo Christian structures. Um, but there was no influence. And then when I went to St. Andrews, it's an Episcopal school. We would have chapel three times a week, mm. but you know, I'm the kid in the, in the pew like this, <laughs> right? You know, not paying any attention yeah. to these things. Meanwhile, you know, as I get older, I get more caught up in the South Florida lifestyle. Um, you know, I'm partying more, I'm doing, yeah. you know, I'm being that, that kid, yeah. you know, I, I think that, 
was a challenge. And then in college, I just was in this free fall of, of, Ugh. of what's the best way to describe it? I, I, I had no, um, uh, belief system that was, mm. um, that was able to withstand failure. Huh? Yeah. What do you mean by that? Uh, so, you know, my dream was to play football in college. Oh. You know, I did a fifth year, did a postgraduate year up in Connecticut to wow. play, was on the best team in our school's 112 year history. Wow. We were, we'd beat teams by 50, point, you know, 50 points. And, but I had to split time with this other guy. This kid went to UPenn where his dad, he was a legacy, but I wanted to go to a big school, but I didn't get any big school offers. And so the idea was I'd go to Penn state I, I, for lacrosse and I'd walk on to which you remember Rick Slater. Yes. And Rick did that as well too. Yes. Right. He was the oldest division one walk on at Penn state in history, 29 years old. Crazy. And Joe Paterno is one of his favorite players of all time was Rick Slater. I can't, I didn't know yeah, that. that. And that happened a few years after, uh, you know, I left Penn state. So I, but I knew Jopa love walk-ons. And so but when I got there, the freshman quarterback was Kerry Collins. And, you know, there was no way I could usurp that prowess, right? There was nothing. I, 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 so I quit on this dream. And because I, I believe I didn't have even a modicum of that type of structure, hmm. that piece of uh, um, um, what virtuistic resilience, maybe, or, or, uh, a value system that could withstand that fall from grace, right? Mm. That 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 archetypical uh, a process of of young men, right? Our fall from grace, right? And so, in the midst of my profound fall, I kept falling and falling oh. and falling. And even though I was, you know, I was an art major with a minor in poetry, and I took a truckload of philosophy, a truckload of psychology, wow. a truckload of sociology yeah. and the humanities. And even though I was desperate for some structure and huh. seeking this out and all these random courses that yeah, I was yeah, taking, yeah. I wasn't there to get a degree in art for sure. I was there to just try and reshape a structure that could catch this free fall. Huh. And it never happened. Wow. And so that's why that was the the pretense for wanting to go into the teams because I I felt the teams had the structure, mm -hmm. right? You know that first book I read with you know men with green faces or love it. You know uh, um, what was it a uh, uh, quiet men dark waters or yeah, whatever you remember yeah. that one? Then you know Patches book, you know, <laughs> Point Man, and yeah. then Rogue Warrior, yeah. and and you read these things and the whole thing the narrative that these men would describe was this permanent structure mm -hmm. and it's and it's these boundaries yes these contained boundaries that control this uh this um this mindset yeah and i i was like that's what i need wow. i need structure i need a structure that i can build a foundation of faith on but i didn't know it was faith i, I didn't get that huh. i i because i i took a bunch of theology courses and and um some courses on metaphysics and you know, was drawn towards Native American culture. Then I was yeah. drawn towards <laughs> Hindu culture. Then I was drawn yeah. towards yeah. Buddhism. Yeah. And, you know, I was that hippie kid. Right? <laughs> I, I always, I always, you know, I always laugh when I tell everybody, you know, in these talks that I'm giving, I like, I go, uh, you know, hey, I'll, I'll interject, you know, by the way, I was an art major with a minor <laughs> in poetry and they all start laughing. I'm, I'm like, Hey man, check yourself. Cause I'm a hippie who can kill you. So, and halt, you know, and, and it's like, and I, everybody laughs, but I'm like, no, I'm serious. You know? And, and so it, it was this, this, this desperation hmm. to find something that could catch me. And so I go on the teams yeah. and I didn't realize how intense that framework was. <laughs> I was not prepared for that. Oh. And and so when I got in and got going and, you know, because, you know, Bud's just, you know, is there 15 months? It's like, man, I, I'm not, it's not coming together. It's not coming huh. together. And so what did I do? I gravitated toward the structure more of the culture as opposed to the mindset. Interesting. Right? And, the, and the culture in the late nineties was, yeah. you know, party hard yeah, and play hard that's and true man and, and and then i met bruce right yeah that shifted well the big I, I, let me back up first platoon uh there was a guy in my platoon named double g uh morgan o'neill i don't think and I yeah 
real quiet guy. He had five kids at the time. Wow. And I was in a platoon called Hotel Hell, right? We had <laughs> Wild Bill Jewett. We had Joe Mastrangelo. We had all these uh, Landry Watson. I wow. mean, just like titans of of going hard at yeah. every level. And then there's Double G and Double G was a Christian and Double G had a family and Double G had a wife and he would never go out. And, and, and I remember berating this poor new guy with me, just hammering him like the old saying, well, if, you know, you got to be leery of someone who doesn't drink with you. Yeah. All that shit that yeah. was, I accepted, right? Yeah. Be, because I was trying to put, create this framework where, I mean, I remember being in Guam and I remember I got hazed real bad. I missed a muster and they oh. beat the snot out of me and made me run all, do a run, swim, run all around base, like at noon and oh. getting hammered. And I went back and double G was my room and I went in and, and he was, it was a Sunday and there he is. He's reading his Bible and stuff. And I wow. just were like, man, whoa, how can you do this? How can you do this? I don't get it. How, yeah. how can you do the job and live the life, but also be committed to God? Yeah. And I, I didn't get it. And I, and I, and I, and I actually was not very, I wouldn't call, I wasn't mean to him. I was, but my, my statements were now I know in his mind, he's must, well, you're just ignorant. Mm. You, you just don't get it. You don't mm. have this structure. And so you don't, you're afraid of it. Yeah. Now fast forward, second platoon in Afghanistan. And I'm surrounded by some really devout guys. This guy, John Collins was a devout Christian. Monty Sherritt's remember Monty. Yeah. And Monty in particular, cause I'd gone through buds with Monty and I was at team one with Monty. Now we're in this platoon together with Monty and every day, they would pray. They'd have a Bible session wow. every day. And here we are, not even a year after 9-11 or, you know, horrible living conditions in hmm. Kandahar, Bob, yeah. or, Bob, mostly Kandahar. And every day I'm watching these two dudes pray. And yeah. I'm like, what do you, and finally I was just like, what are you guys doing, man? Yeah. Well, how can you pray to God and then the potential we can go out and we'll have to take out a bunch of dudes that, yeah. that, that day. Yeah. How, how can you justify all that? Huh. And they would give me answers. And wow. I was just like, well, that's interesting. Huh. And, and they would just continue. They wouldn't, they were relentless on me. Man. Hey, Rut, man. Hey, heathen, why don't you come <laughs> over here? And, why don't you come over here and, yeah, and yeah. sit with us? Yeah. Why don't you come over here and listen? Ah, fuck you guys. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was afraid of it. And then- it was during that trip where, you know, I, I, I for the first time I, I asked God for some help and, and it was, uh, a, a, a to say cataclysmic is an understatement, but wow. it was revolutionary. It was a, a revelatory moment of my self-consciousness huh. that, oh, as I'm in free fall, if I pray, I'm caught, huh. the free fall stops. Yeah. Now, how does that happen? Yeah. How do you allow, how do you allow this thing that exists within the omnipotent infinite of all things we have ever been able to contemplate and still we aren't capable of understanding the true, the true intensity of that catch, yeah. that, that grace. Yeah. And that's what started me down the path. And it took me 10 years Wow. from probably 02 to 2012 to figure out that one, I was worthy of, of Christ's love Yeah. Two, that he would not only accept me and all my faults, but then forgive me. That was the one that was like, yeah. man, I, I've done some horrible shit. Yeah. How are you going to forgive me? And and when you get to that place, yeah. it, it just, it changed my whole entire perception of existence wow. because now I know no matter what I do, no matter how much I fall from grace yes. every day, because I know tomorrow or today I'm going to come up short. Yeah. I'm going to come up short in some capacity with someone that I love yeah. dearly. But in that, in that lack of talent, in that sin, whatever, however you want to describe it, if I pray, I'm going to be caught huh. and I'll have a framework to catch me. Nice. You know, I, um, I grew up, my, my parents were pretty religious and we went to church every Sunday and it, 
I wasn't ready to to receive that or be a part of that at that moment. I went I went through the motions. Like I I mean I was a kid with ADHD, and so like sitting in church trying to be quiet. Oh my god, was torture. Yeah, in many cases. Yep. Um, it actually does the inverse, right? It does makes I, you makes you hate it. I I totally like I've I, heard that when, from so many guys. When I didn't have to go anymore, when it became my choice as to whether or not I would go to church, I didn't go. Wow. And it wasn't until boot camp when on, on Sundays, the only thing that you could do other for yourself was to go to church. Yeah. So I would march to church on, on base and I would sit in church and I would, I, I mean, I didn't know what I was doing. Yeah. I just went yeah. there yeah, yeah. and I would spend that time and that time that was, that was a refuge for me. Yeah. You know? And I think about that the it, refuge it, of the total. church or, it's or the, so, yeah, yeah. like, because I mean, you know, when you go to like, I'm middle-class kid, I had friends, I had everything that you could want at growing up. And then I get thrown into this culture shock of boot camp. And I mean, you know, <laughs> Navy boot camp comparatively to other boot camps, Marine is nothing. Yeah, it's nothing, <laughs> yeah, yeah, but yeah. it was still it's a big different. culture shock. It's culture shock. Yeah. And and I remember that the going to church was the the refuse that I had. And I once I made it out of boot camp and got to buds and the teams, it really didn't circle back until I had a roommate who was very agnostic. And he refused to believe anything and and it angered me yeah even though i wasn't a practicing christian that's right, it that's angered right. yeah, me you were mad and, and i was and and like he's he's like coming at it from a um academic point of view and i i really didn't have answers to i i knew yeah. in my heart he was wrong yep. but i didn't have the tools or the I didn't have a way to express how he was wrong. Yeah. And it just made me so frustrated, like, Arr! but, um, and it, but it wasn't until, um, probably again, Jamie coming into my life that we started to be more consistent about That's cool. our faith and going yeah. to church and talking about things and, uh, things of that nature. So I've kind of, you know, in a roundabout way, return back full to, circle. Yeah, you yeah. know, I, I wouldn't say I've closed that loop yet. Yeah. I'm, I'm still in that process. Like how you, about your children? How about the boys? Um, did, did, have you been able to influence them at all? My younger one, not so much. Cause he now lives with his mom. Yep. And she wasn't very religious at all. Yeah. Uh, my older one has become curious and, and, and I don't have answers for him either. Yeah. But I'm, I'm, I'm relieved in many cases that he has that curiosity. Yeah. And, you know, at some point like me, he'll find his answers, you know, like I'm still searching for my answers. You've found your answers. That's, that gives me hope that there are answers for me at some point. Absolutely. And it's just a matter of finding them. And, you know, it's, it's, um, there's a lot of things that have become more clear to me as I get older. Yeah. And <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> isn't it funny how that works? Right? Damn it. <laughs> a lot of failures. <laughs> that's a yeah, big one. Yeah. But but that but my faith has become something that's become a little bit clearer to me Amen. as I move forward. So yeah. that's and I and I have a lot to thank for my parents being, you know, they they were there for me in the early years. Uh, and then of course Jamie bringing me back in a sense. And, cool. the, and I hate to say it, but the Navy too. The Navy brought me back. Uh, actually, I think the Navy was what really planted that seed again for me. Or That's cultivated cool. the seed. That's cool. Um, let me ask this question. This is a hard question sometimes. <laughs> if if, they, if if this is the hard question, I'm quitting. <laughs> give, give me the bell, brother. I'm, I'm out of here. Because these, these are not, it's like, I thought I was coming on to talk about buds and stuff. You know, it's like, holy cow, Jeff. Well, we're talking I, about. I should have known it was, I was going to get just, just uh, illuminated with these uh, well, questions. The, so. the thing about it is like, you have, you have become a success in your field. You are at the top of your game. Thank you. Right. But that didn't come easy. No, that didn't come, but that, that wasn't by chance or luck. You know, that was work. That was effort. That yeah. was failures. That was mistakes. And that's what I feel is valuable to the viewers is talking about those. Like, Amen. like how, how did you overcome some of these setbacks? Like what, you know, like uh, it's easy to say, oh, I just kept trying. Yeah, no, but that's not really, that's, that's right. That's a intellectually lazy response. That's right. What did you do? What did you do? What was the secret? You know, cause like so many guys that have become successful, did it on their own terms. Yep. 
They found a way yeah. to be successful. There's some commonality. Like in doing this show, I've started to see a, a few recurring themes, yeah. right? Yeah. Which is great, but it's also unique to hear how people overcame those challenges, those failures, in particular, like what did they learn from them right. that helped them overcome and become the success that they are now? Absolutely. So that's you know, the critical information. It is. That's, yeah. that's, that's, that's the value because like, I feel like in our current state, our culture, if you will, <laughs> yeah, you know. There's a lot lacking. Yes. There's a lot that's missing. Yeah. And and we've had conversations, you and I, I've had conversations with others about, all right, we can bitch and moan about it and say, ah, oh, you know, my buds class was the hardest one after yeah, yeah, that. Yeah, nobody, yeah, you know, yeah. everybody sucked. Or I could try to bring people on and share their message, that's even right. though that's not the necessary message that is branded with yep. them. It's like, what did you get from it? What did you get from your journey? Yeah, for sure. You know, and how can we share that information? Because I promise people this every time it will, it will have an impact on somebody. Somebody uh, will absolutely. take away, like, I can do that. I didn't think of it that way. That makes sense. My, I now have purpose. Those are the types of things that I feel like if we can reach one person in that way, yeah. then it's all, it's a huge success. Amen to that. So what's, you know, all right, what's next? Yeah. One? What do you got so for I've, me? I've prepared Let you. Me stretch out. <laughs> I've prepared you for this one. Uh, are you happy with yourself? Ha. <sighs> Man, I struggle with happiness. Happiness <sighs> is a fleeting emotion. hundred percent. Yeah. Um, I am, you know, I mean, I think humans have be have become so. Um, it's not manipulated. They've become so um, influenced, mm. right? That that that's the be all end all. Well, I know. Like that's what you aspire to. Yeah. And uh, I, as a person who has been kind of this had this motivational presence in me in my life yeah. and not, not necessarily the motivation to become the best, but more so the deepest motivation I've always felt is to try and lift other people up. Yes. Right. That's just who I am. It's yeah. what I am. It's what I've always been. My yeah. mom has said that. She said, <laughs> since you were a little boy, you've always been the kid who finds the kid who's not involved, walk over, lift them up, bring them in. And yeah. Uh, the great uh, Jeff Enderlin, uh, Indy, yeah. used to call me uh, the hand grenade of positivity. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, I, I th so you would there is, a, 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 I think, a, a case to be made that within that structure, within that desire, within that drive, happiness is is within the spectrum of the 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 desired outcome. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But that's not it. Yeah. That's not why uh -huh. that's not what I seek. Okay. And it goes back and you just made a, a great point about that one person in the audience, that one person on the range, that one person you meet randomly who sees you somewhere and says, aren't you, you're yeah. frog logic guy yeah. or whatever. And yeah. Hey, how are you doing? Yeah. Or, for me, I am I am at, at my best when I feel as if in the moment I have the greatest understanding of what I need to be doing to support the mission I'm on. Uh, does that make sense? It does. Like, like like I feel wonderful when one of my children is in a in a dire situation. And I'm present mm. and I'm there and I'm giving good advice or I'm helping them figure their own interpretation of perception out. Mm. Uh, when I'm um, when I've left an event and someone like just last night, uh, I, I was doing a big event at um, at True Lux near here. And oh, I love that place. Yeah, yeah. And, and it was a, 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 I think it was, I forget what, what group it was, whether it was a Wells Fargo team or something like that. But this woman came up to me after and said, man, I really needed to hear that tonight. And, and I, she goes, I want, you know, you called me, 
called me out without mm. calling me out. <laughs> and that was heavy to hear. Yeah. But now I know there's some things I need to work on. Yeah. And, I, and, and that's not happiness. Yeah. That's not joy. Right, right. That's not elation. Or, that's more, you know, I equate um, the, 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 the fundamentals of, of happiness to be um, something like this. It's like the, the, the ease of life hmm. consumes you. Right? That life gets a little easy in the moment. I got you. Right? Yeah, yeah. Like, and and that's a that's that lifts the you know the 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 atlas shrug that lifts yeah. that lifts that ball of weight that lifts the cross off my shoulder for a second. Yes. And says, okay, yeah, that yeah. that there's there's pleasure is not the right word. It's there's um clarity. Oh. And I think clarity for a lot of people. It, should be affiliated with happiness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Instead of just no, I I need to be, you know, in that moment where I'm I'm filled with profound joy, I'm filled with elation, yeah. I'm filled with ease, and that's my quest on a regular basis because it's 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 an illusion mm. that's been generated <laughs> by the self-help movement. Yeah. And now I'm yeah. kicking myself in the ass. I'm part of that, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but, you know, everybody knows there's no such thing as 6-minute abs, right? Yes. Everybody knows they're like it's virtually impossible to make a million dollars in a month on TikTok, right? Yeah. Everybody knows that anything good in life comes through hard work, dedication, suffering, and pain. Yeah. And 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 that is the clarity. So that's when I know I feel that sensation or relative sensation of happiness is when I feel some real clarity in the moment. Nice. Like, no, this is where I'm supposed to be. Yes. I, I, I feel like I'm doing the right thing yeah, for yeah. the people I love. And then for the people that I'm trying to yeah. uh, inspire. Yeah. That's, that's the framework of happiness that I look at it with. I love hearing that. So let's go this, let's go this direction. So you walk into a professional baseball team's <laughs> locker room. All right. There you are. You walk into this team. And you got all these guys. These are like professional. They're at the peak of their game. Like they're literally working their way to the World Series. And you go in there. Did that bring you happiness? Whoa. <laughs> well, that's a heavy question, man. <laughs> um, my experience with the Red Sox was one of the most profound experiences I've ever had. I can imagine. Yeah, yeah. it was, it, you know, and every year starting 16 and, and then 17, it got more. And by 18, you know, Dave Dombrowski and, and, and Alex Cora had asked me, Hey, you know, we really need, we, we really want Mookie bets to move into this space where he can take the reins from Dustin Pedroia, who had kind of Man. moved out of that leadership yeah. role. And, and we, we need you to help him with that. Wow. And so for me, it was like, how the hell am I going <laughs> to, what am I, at first I'm like, what? what do you want me to do? What? I was like, I was like, okay. Um, but very quickly I came to realize that these men were in this really unique team. Yeah. Right. Um, they were in this really unique space. Everything had come together. And so what I simply did was I I relied on the other guys that had a little bit more wisdom than he did. And I would kind of prompt them to say, hey, move in to help him. Yeah. Like step forward. And I and I always thought about those great guys who had three, four, five platoons. Yeah. That they would, they'd be watching you all. You didn't yeah. think they were watching you, <laughs> but all of a sudden they'd see you in that frustration or they'd see that shift in personality and they would come up and be like, Hey man, what's up, man? Yeah, 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 yeah. Why are you all fucked up? <laughs> you know? and, and you're like, you're like, what do you mean? They're like, no, dude, you're jacked up. Let yeah, me yeah. help you. And yeah. be like, okay. And, yeah. and so that was kind of the model that I, yeah. I took. And so I would have David Price, wow. you know, I would go to Mitch Moreland. I would go to uh, Jackie Bradley. I would go to um, Brock Holt, man. Brock wow. is one of the greatest teammates 
I've ever seen in any team, whether really? special operations, whether it, whether elite sports teams, elite business teams, Brock Holt is one of the best teammates I've ever seen in my entire wow. life. And if you watch Brock play, he wasn't this all-star player, but when he played, he played with that context of happiness. He and his happiness lifted the whole team, in particular Mookie up. Huh. And it gave Mookie this this freedom to become this like he'd run out on a field with the towel <laughs> and he'd have it on his head. And you just saw this young man that didn't say intentionally, I'm going to become the leader. You saw this team said open their the space so he could flourish to support him. And and the big thing too was like, hey, Mookie, you don't have to go out there and win the game every night. Yeah. You've got JD Martinez. Yeah. You've got Bogarts. Yeah. You've got, you know, all uh, these players that'll players support roster. you. And then you have Chris Sale, yeah. right? Who can come in and take care of the batters because maybe they got up on a batter. <laughs> so this whole team came together. Wow. Got around him, created this, this, they lifted the burden off him and gave him the space to mature into one of the greatest players in history. Wow. And, and so for me, it was like it, that, that ability or yeah. that, that for me to do was, was just this, it, it was transformational. Yeah. Cause, yeah. cause you now it's like, here I am. I'm I'm a part of another elite team. I'm not a part of it, but I'm I'm on this this yeah, edge of it. A supporting. That's element. right. I'm I'm an instructor. Right? Yeah, yeah, like yeah, I'm yeah. an instructor on the edge, and you just watch it, yeah. and it gets better and oh, better man, and better and amazing. better. And and to this culmination of 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 you know when they won against the Dodgers, yeah. and, and it was this beautiful, beautiful, beautiful yeah. experience, you know? Uh, but you know, like is the case with anything, you know, Dave got fired, you know, seven months later and I went with him. So, <laughs> so you, know, you know, I mean, but, but, but that's, that's, that's an outcome, maybe not a positive outcome, but that's an outcome. For me, it was, for me, it was because it was the humility. Yeah. And, and for me, I'm always seeking the humility and the failure, right? Yes. And that's what I, that's what keeps me tuned up. In. That's the thing. That's right. When we, we talked about this a little bit off air before the show, we talked about defining talent. That's right. And one of the defining characteristics, in my opinion, is that humility. That's right. Those that have that humility are willing and able to make changes, yep. uh, adjustments, improvisations. They're able Beautiful to word. adapt to their circumstances. Yep. And that's what ultimately is a key component to being successful on the battlefield. Yeah. You know, we're, we're training, training. We have a, we have some knowns. Yep. We have some knowns. We have some known unknowns, but we have a lot of unknown unknowns that's right. that we're going into. And that's, that is brilliantly so, put. Yeah. That's yeah. a key thing. That's a very tough thing. But you know, I mean, the value of being able to walk into a ball club at that level and provide the environment for him to flourish, to provide him the guy and, and in a soft touch way. Yeah, it That's was, the, it was cause I've, I learned very quickly. It's, it's very different than our community, right? Yeah. yeah. There's a lot more direct influence that's required for us. Yes. Um, and I think it's cause the intensity of that oh, existential yeah. reality, you can't, you don't have time. We you don't gotta, have to, we have yeah, to cut 100%, through the BS hundred percent, and get to the remedy as fast as possible. With them, it, there is time. It, yeah. It's in, in a long season. It's 162 games, man. Yes. It's, it's debilitating. Yeah. It's brutal. But like, I'll, I'll share with you my story this year. You know, this year, I worked with the Charlotte Panthers. Nice. And so, you know, I came in, you know, it was Matt's third year. They were out of COVID, out of the craziness. Yeah. Christian was healthy. Their defense led by Shaq Thompson was incredible. They were they had this great group of young guys. I mean, really talented young players Yeah, that, and that was kind of what I was charged with to do to say, Hey, let's try and inspire these young kids to move into that, uh, to, to take the reins of their own personal leadership, right. Yes. To, to, to diffuse. Cause the one thing I'll tell you now that I've seen in, in sports is it's, it's, it's really changed a lot since I first started working with teams and, and now, uh, a, a centralized leadership is, 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 is almost a taboo idea in, in many teams wow. nowadays. They, they don't want it. 
Interesting. Right? These players, in particular, the people at, at the top that are the leaders, they don't want the burden of the responsibility, huh. right? They want they want to be able to softly guide or, or sure. subtle touches here yeah. and there, but they don't want to be the rah-rah, hoo let's go, come on. Yeah, they, yeah. That's not the way they work. Yeah. It's just a different culture now. And so what it is, it's, it's, it's the spreading, it's decentralizing that leadership yeah. across the spectrum of yes. it, whether offense, defense, infield, outfield, whatever sport it might be to diffuse that leadership across multiple people yeah. that have the potential to bear the burden. Yeah. And so when I came in and that's what I try to do, you know, uh, you know, it, it was, it, it, it's, it's a different sport, but it, the, the mindsets are all very similar, right? Sure. It's like, Hey, this is big boy rules. Yeah, yeah. This is, this is profession. Yeah. You know, there's a lot at stake, yeah. a lot of money going on. Yeah. You, you show up and you do the work. If yeah. you don't, you're out. Um, the, the, the challenge that I think, you know, that that team had was, you know, the, there wasn't a lot of confidence left in Matt, unfortunately. Mm. I think the three years and the struggles he had had uh, didn't play out. I think, you know, uh, Baker coming in and not being able to, because there was a lot of energy with Baker coming in. He possesses, like he is a player's player. Nice. He's a really good dude. He he really, but when, when his performance didn't manifest in the way that they had hoped it would, yeah. I think you know, the powers that be the owner, the GM, they realize, all right, let's, let's, let's plan for next year. Yeah. And that was where the shift began. And uh, so when Matt left, I, I, once again, I left with that. <laughs> and, and, yeah. and so it, it's, you know, it was a, a, it was from the world series to being one of the bottom teams. Yeah. And, and so that I learned Every bit as much as I learned working for the 2018 world champion Red Sox yeah. of working with one of the, 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 the lowest teams in, in the league yeah. and, and not having this, you know, profound, you know, revel revelatory influence yeah, that yeah. makes them champions yeah. or whatever. I, and so that spectrum is a wonderful balance for me. It's so true. And, and that's, again, going back to this, 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 um, this kind of, uh, um, weaving reference of, of, uh, with, with age comes wisdom mm. and the recognition that, Hey, those failures and, or my inability to, uh, uh, catapult somebody into a position where they have the best year, of their, their career, whatever that spark that collectively brings yeah. everybody together, you know, to recognize, man, I, I gotta be humble. This is a lot more difficult. Yeah. I got to be a part of like, the perfect moment, the perfect time, the mm -hmm. perfect team yeah. at, you know, right time, right place. Yeah. And then the opposite of that, you know, is pretty yeah. much true with the, But, uh, but again, what I learned from huh. Matt Ioannidis, Christian McCaffrey, Shaq Thompson, Frankie uh, Luvo, I, I just, it's, you can't put a price tag on oh, that. And so even at, 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 as long as I've been doing what I'm doing, man, I'm still learning at the highest possible level to, sure. of, of what, what to do and what not to do. I love hearing that. Speaking of which, what is like some of the best advice that you were given by a mentor? Wow. Mm, that's really powerful. Um, yeah. All right. You want the best advice? Okay. <laughs> okay. Best advice I was ever given was by probably one of the greatest mentors I've ever had. His name is David Corlew. And David is, was, was Charlie Daniels manager, oh, uh, wow. was with Charlie for 42 years, Holy cow. was his manager for 28 years. Wow. Um, he is a legend in Nashville. He's a legend in, in, in the community in the country music community. Uh, he was Charlie's best friend. Wow. Uh, and, you know, I got the incredible opportunity to meet them through uh, helping Cindy Dietz do a, a, a Dietz Foundation I event remember, yeah. back in 13. And um, they invited me to start participating with their Journey Home Project event they would do every year in, in, in Nashville. Nice. And so I got to know this guy and, and he, so he, but he's this old 
cowboy from, you know, grew up on dirt floors in, yeah. in West Tennessee. He's got the cowboy mustache. Love it. You know, he, he was a golden gloves boxer as a kid. He wow. was a roadie. I mean, just, he's got that storybook past, wow. but he's got wisdom beyond his years. And, yeah. and, but it's, it's a different kind of wisdom. It's, it's the antithesis really of the wiz, the type of wisdom, or not, not the antithesis. It's a, it's a different delivery in a similar facet that I got from my father, who was the attorney, right? Huh. And so the greatest piece of advice I ever got, uh, he would say to me, he goes, Dave, I used to hang out with Willie Nelson a, a lot. And you know what Willie used to say about, about success and about performance? And I was like, what's that, David? He goes, he goes, you can step on your dick, but don't stand on it. <laughs> and that... <laughs> was some of the greatest mentoring <laughs> advice I've ever got in my life. I love that. And, and, and you know, I, I, I know for all those people, who, I know it's crude. I'm sorry, but let's get to the metaphor. Yeah, of it, right? yeah, yeah. So the idea is, listen, what you put out, what extends out from you yeah. is a part of you, right? And sometimes we... We, we have things that come out from us to give to others yeah. or to project a particular presence. Yeah. And sometimes we do that uh, where we do it in a way that not only is going to be profoundly painful for ourselves, but it's also painful for other people yeah. right? to watch, to yeah. pay attention to, yeah. to not be... Uh, concise with our uh, our our actions, and then not to become brilliantly arrogant huh. with our 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 lack of awareness that hey yeah. we're doing something that's not only offensive, but that is and, and by all means I'm not saying you know you know live in this politically correct space. Obviously, I wouldn't have said that if I believe that. So, <laughs> so the idea is like hey. You know, I'm going to personify this, but if it ain't right, change it Yes, and be willing to change it. I like that. And then the biggest is be willing to hear, Hey, Rut, you know, get off your pecker, man. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you know. I love that. You can step on it. Just don't stand on That's it. That's right. That's great. That's that right. is of all the pieces of advice. That is such a succinct and clear proverb almost, you know? <laughs> That's a great one. I well, like that I one. I mean, you think about these guys. I mean, you know, the, the, you know, when you, th you think about growing up in the music business and in, in the fifties and sixties, like wow. Willie Nelson did yeah. when, it, you know, you're, you're paying, you're playing, you know, 300 <sighs> dates a year just to survive, just to eat. And, and then, you know, all of a sudden late 1960s, it kind of explodes right yeah. now there's stadium things. And then you're still grinding. Yeah. And then finally get some success in the seventies, but you still have that old school mentality. And that's what I think a lot of those old country music guys have. They yes. have that. Hey, Hey, I, I, just because I might be playing in front of a stadium today, you know, tomorrow I might be in that honky tonk. Yeah. And, and, and it can take one bad move yeah. or one dumb thing yeah. and you're right back there. Yeah. You know? And I think that was what Dave was trying to tell me. I he said, that. you know, Dave, as you, as you evolve, as you, and I used to lean on him so heavily for, you know, when the, when the never quit podcast kind of exploded a little bit, you know, in our, in our little world or whatever, you know, he, I would always call him and be like, man, wh what do you do about this? And what do you do about huh. this? And and he was just this perpetual, uh, um, um, river of truth. Wow. And, and, and it was these, Love these very, it. these, these, these ideas, these lessons that were not, uh, not, not, uh, concocted on the whim of what he thought I needed to hear at the moment. Yeah. It was built around the incredibly difficult and challenging life. And then also this incredible, I mean, the dude's met four presidents, right? Wow. He's toured all over the world. Wow. He's played in, in, you know, in front of 80,000 people before. And, wow. you know, he was, his best friend was a country music icon. Yeah. And this one of the most loved people in yeah. all of country music, but he was humble Man. and gracious in order of, to deliver that, that information to me on a regular basis. So I love that. I'm eternally grateful for him. That is pretty awesome. I, uh, the story behind that is almost as valuable as the actual 
slogan, the metaphor, the, the takeaway. I love it. Um, all right. So then how do you deal with failure? So that's another fantastic question. Uh, man, I used to stink at it. I was, <laughs> I was so bad. I was horrible. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it almost killed me in college, right? Wow. I mean, it, that's it, right. It almost destroyed me in college. And then in the teams, uh, you know, getting injured one uh, right after and then getting rolled and pool yeah. comp and, and it, it just doubt, 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 Man. getting, getting to the team and, and, and being put in check as a new guy at yeah. team one. I mean, that was like, holy cow. And yeah. What did I get myself into? I, I, and then it just got harder and harder <laughs> and harder. Like, I remember when uh, Chief, uh, Senior Chief Dobstaff used to scream at us in, in first phase and be like, it only gets harder. You know, I was like, how is that when, possible? Yeah. That's bull, you know? Yeah. And, and, and then I, it, I think it was probably, it was probably, I would say it's probably in 2006 when I left Blackwater that I finally, I finally gave in to the fact that I, I need to be more open to failure. Mm. Uh, right. And not just failure in, uh, you know, oh, I missed that target yeah, failure yeah. or my techniques off failure, but like, man, I'm not living up to my potential failure. Man. I'm failing myself with my decisions every day. Oh, yeah. I'm failing myself with my behavior yeah, every day. Yeah. I'm failing myself with my relationships. Mm. I'm, I'm failing comprehensively yeah because getting out of teams was a nightmare for me it oh. was i did not do well in that yeah. adjustment that that me identity neither. crisis was Oof. horrific for me i still go through it at that, times oh all the time yeah. for sure and and so i had it took me three years so 2006 when i walked away and i started frog logic yeah. you know for kids that's when i realized man i needed to go to the absolute most fundamental starting point of humility and failure and start from scratch. Man. And that's when I started frog logic. And I just started, I remember my first thing I, I ever did was at a YMCA with uh, <laughs> like 10 kids. Love it. And it was a basic like PT motivational thing. And that's uh, awesome. these kids would one minute be there and the next minute not and <laughs> couldn't do a push up. And here, you know, I'm like, and then my, oh. my next thing was uh, I, I did a, a program for six boys from a foster care home. Oh, nice. And, and I remember that was incredibly difficult because, oh. you know, all, you know, five out of these six kids were, were born to crack mothers. And, mm. and so, you know, how do you, how do I connect with these kids and, and trying to figure all that stuff out? Wow. What, what are the fundamental things that we learned in our community and from our peers yeah. that can be extrapolated and then re-engaged at the, at the, at the at the at the most pivotal level in in early human de child development, yeah. which is that ten to fifteen year old mark, yeah. what is applicable? And so I I started trying these things, and it was abysmal. Like it was, <laughs> I I was horrible. I was absolutely horrible. Uh, and you know, after about two years, I started to get some momentum, and then I remember I had one of my first corporate gigs was a, a big furniture company down in, in, in Southeast Florida. And I went and I gave this, you know, my, the, the speech was the whole context of the speech was you got to be willing to clean the shitters all the time. Cause that was my early career in buds. Yeah, so it's yeah. like, in buds, I'm going to clean the bathrooms. Yep. <laughs> then I got out and I had to wait to go to jump school. So I went to team five. Yeah. So every day I had to clean the bathrooms, right? For five months. Then I went to jump school and had to clean the bathrooms every day. Then I went to 18 Delta and had to clean the bathrooms all <laughs> oh the time. God. Then I checked on board SEAL team one and I had to wait until STT. And so what did I do? I worked in the M M mastered arm shack and I had to clean the bathrooms, bathrooms all the time. Oh my God. So the whole pretense for this thing was no matter how badass you think you are. Oh Yeah. Today might be the day you got to go clean the head. Yeah. And, 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 but I did. So I had this, you know, this, 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 uh, uh, this, ve this gruff veil. And I'm <laughs> trying to tell these people yeah, and you yeah. got to be willing to clean. Yeah. And they're looking at me like I had nine eyes. Right. And, <laughs> and I'm, they're like, what? And I remember finishing 
And I went up to the, the CEO of the company afterwards. I go, you know, did you, was that good enough, sir? And he's like, well, you know, it's different in the civilian world. <laughs> And I, and I was like, well, what do you mean? You know, How everybody should clean the, the head. Yeah. Right. And, and he gave me this great insight. He's like, listen, you have to know your audience. And, and that was really a wake up. Cause you know, I had gone from zero to, you know, I talked to almost 7,000 kids in, in almost two and a half years in, wow. in North America when, with frog logic and, and in Canada, I, 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 was doing, I was going to Canada every few months, wow. to, you know, to work up with this guy up in a, a grade school in Ottawa and talk to just thousands of kids up there. Wow. And, and this guy kind of, so like, I got this, it's, I, it's I'm talking same thing. I'll do the same thing, you know? Yeah. And it was abysmal and it wow. was horrible and wow. I stunk. And then, you know, I, I, you know, the economy collapsed. I went to work for, you know, uh, OGA for a while and, and I, I got another wake up call, another lesson. And so, you know, for me, it's, it's the idea that failure is, is perpetual, right? Mm. It, it, you're going to exist in a, in, in a state of perpetuity with failure, yeah, yeah. no matter what, yeah. no matter what you like, yeah. you know, I'm a failure because my glasses are scratched and I'm too lazy to go and get new glasses, <laughs> right? Uh, I'm a failure because I drink too much coffee, yeah. right? I'm a failure because I, you know, I, I didn't iron my pants before I came on, or, <sighs> you know, so it's like, Find the surf. right, right. So it's like, all right wait a minute, wait a minute, that can, that can be consuming. So yeah. what do I extrapolate out of the context of failure? Yeah. What, what do I pull? What is the lesson? Yeah, yeah. And then, and so what I'm always doing now is I'm, I've, I've got kind of these core understandings of, of the, the failures I really need to be cognizant of. Uh -huh. I need to be focused on and I need to pay attention to more, more, um, uh, with greater clarity. Nice. And so that's what I'm looking for now. I'm looking okay. for the specificity of, 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 of the failure as it relates to my being. Wow. Not so much as to the action itself. Right. But how is it going to continue to reshape or keep this foundation that I've been desperate to, to construct? Right. Um, so, I do li live within that humble state and that faithful state. I love it. All right. Well, let's start wrapping things up with one final question. What do you want our listeners to take away? I think for me, um, oh man, that's a great question. I think I would love it if, if your audience thinks about this, um, that, that, life is imbued with suffering. Mm. It's inevitable yeah. no matter what. Yeah. And I think that's the beauty right now in particular with our community that is now out doing this type of thing, mm. you know, doing the shows, uh, teaching courses around the country. Um, and, and everybody needs to know, you know, you have a course with Jeff you're not just getting firearms training, man. You're getting all of these <laughs> lessons, you know, whether you have a course with Tim or, or all these wonderful people out yeah. there that are trying to instill these lessons learned, yeah. right? These very difficult lessons learned yeah. in, into, into their audiences and into their, 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 their students in, in, in some, some, some aspect. But for me, what I would love for your group to know is that you have to have a foundation that will catch you. Okay. You have yeah. to have, uh, uh, you know, people call it a safety net, people call it whatever, yeah. whatever metaphor you want to use yeah. for what it is, is that fear is inescapable. You're always going to have it, right? You're, you're going to be afraid in some content you're wired for it. You've been taught it your whole life True. And, and now more than ever fear is being used as a profound tool. Um, and oh. so you're going to be afraid and you're going to feel that fall. You're going to feel that fall from grace. You're going to feel that fall because of your, your, your either, uh, through your choice of failure or through some external unforeseen thing, the yeah. unknown unknown cause you, and you're going to fall. Yeah. But if you figure out how to cultivate or to grow or to build or to construct a foundation that you can land on, now it doesn't necessarily need to be a, a soft landing. That's, <laughs> that, that, that's a little illusion. dynamic peel up. Hey, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> but it's ass head, right? Yeah. Ass, ass back head, yeah. right? Um, you're going to fall. But if you have a, a, a well thought out, uh, well uh, articulated foundation, that fall 
uh, won't be as painful mm. and will also be very informative for you when you get back up. I love hearing that. Uh, so much more I want to talk about, but <laughs> but we got to got to kind of get you on to your next gig. Where can people learn more about you and what you're doing? I appreciate that. Uh, so I've been off social media for the last year and a half. I know. Um, I, you know, it, it just, I kind of got locked out with no explanation before yeah. the, uh, before the, uh, election. Uh, and again, you know, you know me, I'm not a political guy at yeah, all. Yeah. I was, I, so I, I, I guess I just hit the, the algorithm. Uh, and as we all figure, know, as, figure. as we all know, are, yeah. are active and, and very much alive in all these different places. So true. Um, which is unfortunate. Um, but when, you know, our, I guess, they, they perceive the information that we're trying to instill in people as a threat yep. in some capacity. So um, I just recently got back on Twitter. Good for you. Yeah. So it's been about about a year and a half since I've been posting anything and I'm just kind of feeling out. I, I am doing a, a, an occasional daily dose of frog logic. Nice. So I'm, I'm glad to hear yeah, those coming back. Yeah, they're coming back. Um, uh, I've been offline with my podcast for about a year. I just, I mean, I, you know, I started making content in 2007 to six and, yeah. and, you know, up until 2020, you know, it was every day, all day, as you a know, lot. as a content oh. creator and I, 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 and I just, I was burned out. Yeah. I needed a break and I needed to take a step, get, get some perspective. So my plan is to start my, the frog logic podcast back up Great. here soon. Um, you know, I'm on Twitter, obviously my website, we're getting ready to do a redo on the website. Nice. We're going to launch. What, what's the website? Teamfroglogic.com. Perfect. Uh, the, the web, the, the podcast is, uh, uh, the frog logic podcast. And then the, on Twitter, it's at team frog logic. Perfect. Yeah, man. Well, I'm grateful for the, you coming back on Twitter. Cause that's how I actually saw that you were coming to Texas. And I was like, Texting you right away. Yeah, since I, saw that. Right. I was so happy, man. I was like, <laughs> I was like, yes. This is awesome. <laughs> yeah. All right, folks. Well, that's a wrap. Thank you, David, for coming on the show and sharing all of your lessons. I really appreciate can it. Can I can I say something to of you? Of course, though, Jeff. Jeff, you know, 27 years is, is a long time. <laughs> but I, I want to tell you that you were one of those instrumental people uh, in my early development years and third phase and buds that really helped me understand. Uh, there's a lot more to being a seal than just being tough huh. and, and you have continued to evolve in, in that way. And so wow. it's just a, a really, it's an honor to be here with you. Uh, it's wow. an honor to be your friend. And I just, uh, I have so much faith and, and love for you, brother. Well, thank you. The honor is mine. It really is, David. To see you, how you've been so successful from those early days is truly, you know, it's very, pr I'm very proud of that. I'm very prideful for that. Thank you. Um, uh, I want to thank our audience, obviously, for listening. Thank our sponsors for helping with this. Thank the men and women holding the line. Check out all our previous podcasts by vid visiting the bulletproofworkshop.com. Learn more about me and training opportunities by visiting tridentconcepts.com. Until then, I'm Jeff Gonzalez. You're listening to the Bulletproof Workshop podcast. Stay safe or be dangerous.